Eadim, A Rifle and Sword Adventure. Chapter 4, The Revelations of Iris Cadohagan. Written by Sir Hack 72. When one falls under the effects of a major tranquilizer drug, the individual will experience under than a temporary physical disable, is a great reduction of activity in their brain which will remove the feelings of anxiety, fear, tension, agitation that the person is blighted by. For the vampire witch, Iris Cadohagan, the darts that punctured her snow-white skin had what she would describe as the very first feeling of relief in all her long living life. The countless hours, painful studies, and grueling experimentations felt like they had all melted away and in just her little bubble, she could feel absolute freedom of thought. So, this is what bliss feels like? Iris spoke to herself inside her mind. It was absolute darkness and the only thing she can feel in her catatonic state, except for the hearing of her own heartbeat that was softly being heard and the feeling of being submerged in a set of thoughts. Yet for Iris, her own memories were only filled with nothing but failure and sleepless nights in her study. Whenever she tried to re-experience such memories, she was struck with great shock that hurt her mental conditions and her mind suffered like an animal whose foot was caught in a leg trap. With her memories practically off limits for her to think about she was there again swimming inside her mind. At first, Iris didn't mind but the nothingness of her brain soon got over her as she eventually got bored being idle within her mind. She began to swim through her memory searching for something to keep her stimulated. Then she came upon the memory she siphoned from that nightman that she performed the rite of the blooded mind on. At first, she hesitated due to the last time she had done the rite, she suffered an epileptic shock that nearly killed her. The many memories, knowledge that that nightman has stored was so much to bear for Iris. At first, she thought that that nightman was some out of the ordinary adventurer far away from his homeland, wherever it is, in search of riches. Then, after a brief demonstration of some fire magics from him, did she think that the man was some sort of wandering mage. But after Iris bit him and drained his blood did she saw images that she couldn't comprehend. They all came so fast yet the memories were as clear as spring water to her that she was lucky she could handle the mental shock of them all. There were numbers, symbols, geometries, shapes, and theories that all sounded she could understand but for some reason could never grasp. Perhaps I went through them too fast. Maybe I should take it slower. Iris reasoned. She focused her mind to re-enter the memories of the nightman but took care not to overdo herself lest what had happened earlier occur again. She closed her eyes. Took a deep breath and then entered into the memory. The first thing Iris sensed was the sound of soft chirping birds in ambivalent background, then the sound of horns and the footsteps of people that sounded so near to her. She then opened her eyes to a bright blinding light followed by the sights of the said sources of the footsteps. She was surrounded by dozens of people who walked past while inside an urbanized environment that she can't recognize yet feel so familiar. Many of fashion wear didn't fit the description of any Glaisia's nations. She noticed some people wore black coats with a neckwear that dips down to the length of their torsos. Another group of people wore colorful clothing that would not be out of place of a traveling troupe entertainers, and they even have to outlandish hair to complement their clothes. The buildings she was surrounded by Titan above her. Their height could even match the Sleegers Palace district in Harring Point and the elven spires of their ethereal continent, and they were virtually everywhere as far as the eyes could see and perhaps even beyond the eyes vision too. The buildings were all covered head to toe with glass panes that reflects all images that passed by her. Iris peeked at the mirrors and observed herself. Her reflection was the image of a tall black-skinned man in a blue long-sleeved shirt. She must be experiencing Kane, the nightman's memories again. This time however, she doesn't feel a slowly growing mental knife being punctured into her brain so her, taking it slow, approach must be working. Whatever she is in, she has stumbled herself into another world although it's only virtual in nature but memories do not lie. She began to walk forward experiencing the memory before her. She can see what looks like vendors selling food in the streets, some of them look like sausages that were placed in a loaf of bread that was sliced in the middle to allow room for the sausage to fit in between. She passed by strange metal carriages that move without horses that Iris couldn't understand how it can even operate without them. Was it perhaps magic? Were people in this city all powerful mags? It's more practical to walk than to magically lift yourself to move around. She turned her head to the buildings next to her, the glass windows revealed a trove of exotic treasures being sold to the public. 
Iris could make out the merchandise are jewelry, delicious foods, perfumes, furniture that this world offered. Some were styled over familiar designs with intricate patterns similar to the fashions back in Glyasia, others however were of a more minimalistic approach with singular colors and blocky shapes. Continuing to window shop, Iris then came across a window that displayed women's clothes of formal flavorings. There were gowns, blouses, and dresses that sparked Iris' eyes, with much desire. The vampire which eyed a stylish purple dress that was the centerpiece of the collection and imagined herself wearing it. I could be the talk of the TYRE and annual ball with that dress. It would make even Princess Arya and those snooty Slegion nobles jealous. She thought, she could imagine herself twirling around the TYRE and annual ball held nearby from her forest home in the purple dress. It was so one of a kind that no tailor in Glyasia can hope to fabricate. No tailor in Glyasia, Iris soon began to realize to her amazement and horror. The strange black metal magic rods that struck her, the city, the culture, the numbers, symbols, they began to slowly make sense. These humans aren't from Glyasia let alone some far-off nation. Then where did they come from? In our next piece of news today in Good Morning America, said a voice from next door. Walking over to the next set of windows she noticed that crowd of people were staring at whatever the windows had in display. Examining them, she noticed that the people were looking at a set of what she can only describe as magic mirrors. There was a person in a well-pressed coat being displayed on the screen. Additionally, there were several smaller screens that were being displayed inside the bigger screen that showed images and words. Thanks to her acquired knowledge of these new humans, she can read the text on the magic mirror, New Habitable Planet Found, called Benham 3, the text said. The United Earth Federation's Bureau of Colonial Affairs is now seeking applicants for a new colony to be built on the planet. The man on the magic mirror just said. That person then leaned his head to his hand as if he was listening to an inaudible voice. The man seemed to be listening intently to whatever being was speaking to him, then his eyes widened in surprise. This just in, for folks who are listening from New York. Check out your window and see the brand new colony ship the Eardom perform a routine test flight. The ship will be used for the colonization efforts of Benham 3. The crowd watching the magic mirrors disperse to look up into the sky in search of the Eardom. A ship that can fly. What kind of boat can even do that? Iris asked herself. Look up in the sky. There it is, said one of the people. The crowd began to cheer as a slow thundering sound began to form. Iris turned her head skywards to see that her eyes were shadowed by a great object that blocked the sun. Refocusing her vision, she noticed that it was a large wingless object that floated above the city and to her amazement it had the name, the Eardom written on its surface. The crowd cheered as the flying ship floated above the cityscape. What new discovery across the stars will she and her brave pioneers and crew will find? Perhaps you can be one of them. Sign up and explore outer space and the heavens beyond today at the UFE Colonial Affairs Bureau website today. Said the magic mirror. Across the stars? Giant flying boats? Exploring the heavens? Have I attacked gods? Iris' mind flooded with more eldritch questions. She had more answers but now even more questions that are harder than the last. Who were these humans? Are they the Glesian pantheons of gods from all of her world's races now descending upon their world? Are they demons coming to conquer their planet? What and who are these people she has seen? Iris began to collapse on the concrete floor of the city laughing hysterically before slowly screaming in terror. Back in the real world. No. Iris yelled as she opened her eyes and quickly rise up. Yet she recoiled back to the soft cushioning of a bed. She looked at her own body and noticed that her arms and her waist were restrained by belts. Normally if a vampire who is caught in this predicament would most likely be locked in some prison by vampire hunters where the unlucky vampire would be tortured for information. The very thought of that angered Iris as she struggled to break free from her bonds. Let me go this instant. Iris growled. Ah. You scared me. Said a soft voice. Who is there? Show yourself. She said. A woman in a white gown rose up from beneath the ground and scratched her head. The woman's skin was pale as iris and her hair was as black as night just like the vampire witch. 
Who are you? What have you done to me? Let me go. Iris roared. Please calm down and miss. I am not here to hurt you. The pale woman said. But Iris continued to struggle. How can I trust you? Maybe you are a vampire hunter coming to torture the secrets out of me? Iris said. I am not a torturer. That's against my Hippocratic oath and I am here to study you. The woman said. Study me? Well get your knives and holy water out and cut me up. I will tell you nothing. She defiantly pouted. Please miss, I won't even dream of doing that to you. Miss um tell me your name. You do have a name Miss Vampire? The woman asked. Iris' mind was pierced by that question. The pale woman asked for her name. If she was a vampire hunter, she wouldn't even bother to ask that question as they often dehumanize the vampires as nothing more as deceitful monsters who must be driven to extinction. So, for a moment, Iris calmed down and lowered her guard. Iris, Iris Kadohagan. What is your name? She replied then followed it up by a question. The pale woman softly walked towards Iris and sat next to her by the left side of the bed. I am Dr. Hanuel. But you can call me Hannah if you want. She said. Hannah that is a beautiful sounding name. Iris responded. Iris too sounds beautiful too. So Miss Kadohagan or if you want I can call you just Iris if it makes you feel more comfortable if we skip the formalities. So, tell me about yourself Iris. Hannah interrogated. Iris sighed in relief. This questioning was nothing like the horror stories that the spa survivors and escapees of the vampire hunters would have entailed. But she is still bounded by the bed so for now she will indulge Hannah with the pleasure of talking to her if it means buying her time to formulate a means of escape from wherever she is. Well, I assume you know by now I am a vampire. Iris began confessions. I know that already Iris. Now I want to know from the reports that you were shooting out magic from your hands at a private first class Kane Mudwin. Does he ring a bell? Big tall man with black skin? Yes, the nightman I bit. There's something I have learned from him Iris answered, she paused while recollect the memories she had seen from his mid. Before we talk about PFC Mudwin first I want to know from you how you can perform this magic that the soldiers have seen you do. Hannah pressed. Well how should I start this? I mean you are asking me how magic works. Well we draw out our powers from the earth through these crystals that provide a rich source of power called T-U-R-Umble, from the elven words of magic crystals who first discovered them. It is said that the crystals that are deep within earth can allow one to harness the magical powers into five types. There is destruction, restoration, conjuration, altercation, and illusion. Some people can wield magic better than others and whilst others are more specialized in a type of magic. As I assume you have known Miss I mean Hannah, I have demonstrated to Kane my powers in destruction magic. Iris answered. Interesting, so what kind of mage are you? Hannah continued. I am proficient in destruction magic that's a start. I have begun to practice conjuration but on the field of summoning monsters and the undead but I find that unappealing, since I am more of a hands-on person. I am also an adept arcane crafter of destruction-based magic. Iris answered. Arcane crafter? What is that? Hannah asked. Well, I can basically give magical effects to items. Most of the people who practice arcane crafts live in the cities where they perform more practical and harmless enchantments like nourishment, metal hardening, and fortify magic siphoning. I practice more destructive enchantments like fire explosion, poison cloud, and blizzard, which has been under scrutiny by the Slegion Empire for decades. Iris said. Why under such scrutiny by these Slegion Empire people? Well, the Slegion Empire. The liege of the Principality of Tyrian where I live in the Verdon Valley Forest has been cracking down on people who can perform destructive based spells and arcane crafts for over decades due to the rise of magical insurgent attacks by bandits and northmen. Iris said with disdain. That sounds reasonable to me. I do not like the sound of those destructive enchantments you have told me about. You do look upset about it. Why is that? Hannah asked. Iris sighed then bit her lip. 
she had looked like she is hesitant to say her next words. The intended target of the destruction magic ban was my kind the vampires. We are hated and feared from all over the continent due to our powers and long history with the humans. I am surprised you are so unaware of all of this. What part of Glaesia are you from that is so isolated from the rest of the world? Iris asked a question to Hannah now reversing the tables. To tell you the truth Iris, we are not from this world at all. We come from a faraway planet from the sky and traveled here to this planet that we call Benum 3. I assume that Glaesia is what you call this planet am I correct? Hannah replied. In the first time in her long life, Iris felt humiliated. She has seen. Yes, I guess. If you are from the skies are you gods? They say that people who come from the sky are gods. Iris asked with an eager tone. Her eyes widened in excitement and fear as she leaned forward and stared at Dr. Hannah intently. No, the United Federation of Earth are not gods. We are just like normal humans. Although I believe you think we are because of Clark's third law. Hannah said. Clark's third law? It quotes, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. According to the report Strider Group made when they came back, came through several packs of thermite charges at you. Thermite by the way produces fire. So, by your logic, you think Kane is a fire mage or something like that? Hannah hypothesized. Yes, though I find it strange that when he threw those spells at me. I didn't sense any magical energies within him or those thermite spells. Iris remembered, her observations of her nightman adversary was a curiosity to her. Thermite is not magic Iris. It's a compound that burns. Although it's best you talk to an engineer like Kane for a question like that because I am a doctor not a soldier. Hannah said. She struggled to continue smiling after explaining her limited knowledge of military hardware to the vampire. May I ask Kane to be her right now? Iris asked. The man who you attacked his team and bit? Why? I doubt he would even agree to even her about you after what you did to him. Perhaps I can get maybe Sergeant Kincaid or Dr. Shimazaki to, Hannah said, but was interrupted by Iris. No, I need him. I need him to explain these numbers and symbols in my head? Iris said. Just thinking about the eldritch images caused her to get a headache from the sheer confusion it brought to her. Hannah was astonished by Iris' reasons of asking for Cain. When she mentioned about numbers and symbols in her head, she knew that something is seriously was wrong with her. She leaned forward closer to Iris and pressed for more information. What are these things you have in your mind right now? Why ask for PFC Mudwin specifically? Hannah asked. When I bit him, I did something more to him. I also bit through his mind and began to siphon then examine his memories and thoughts. Originally. I wanted to know what his magical knowledge was, but instead I saw his memories that included great flying boats that tightens over buildings, giant skyscraping towers made of glass, magic mirrors with people and words moving around then these numbers and symbols. They all make so much sense yet I just can't grasp it. Iris said. Hannah was understandably shocked by what Iris just told her. This soft-headed approach to interrogating such fantastically hostile creature was indeed paying off, the revelation of what, the vampire witch is capable of has both terrified of her, and fascinated of her. This vampire was able to, siphon the memories and thoughts of Cain. She has thought that perhaps these, numbers and symbols that Iris has described that she was getting confused by were in fact scientific symbols and math formulas. That would explain why she said that it made sense, but unable to grasp it. She wasn't expecting much from such a primitive native of this fantasy world of Benham. 3 or also known by the natives as Glyasia, however the amount of scholarly capacity that Iris knows about her respective field, is something that can be useful for the colony in being able to survive under these new world conditions. I will get Kane and see if it will be okay if he can entertain your questions but I don't have any guarantees that he would agree to come. Stay here Miss Iris and don't try anything. There are guards outside this room right now and I would hate to see you hurt after what we have accomplished so far. Hannah said in a reassuring voice. She stood up from the bed and began to collect her notes and place them in a bag on a nearby desk. Are you sure you will come back to me doctor? Iris asked. 
Just give me a while to sort through these notes and I will get back to you before you know it. Hannah smiled. The Korean doctor walked out of the room, but before she exited she showed a reassuring smile to the vampire which the captive Iris was comforted to see. After getting outside of the room, Hannah sighed then pressed her hidden earpiece by her right ear and called out to her contact from the other side of the device. You have heard all of that Governor White. Hannah said. Yes, we heard and saw everything. The plot thickens Doctor. It is a good call having you doing the interrogation of the vampire Dr. Hanyul. What could have taken days was accomplished in about 30 minutes from you. Governor Jeremy White answered from the earpiece. Right now, we have Iris Trust right now and it's best we capitalize on it. Get me private first class Mudwin to report to the medical bay as soon as he can. Hannah said. I don't know if he will agree to it after fighting her. But I will call Lieutenant Rose now and try to persuade her to send out Mudwin. The governor replied. 30 minutes later. After what had seemed to be the longest and most tense moment of Iris' life, the door to her room opened. The first entrant was Dr. Lee Hanyul who strided quietly towards her and sat down. Then a large man in the same garments that Iris remembered seeing the UFE war when they invaded her home. By the sight of the man's left breast she noticed that the name tag there is stated to be Mudwin. However, Kane was wearing several peculiar accessories compared to what the vampire remembered seeing him. He wore two different sets of neckwear, a wooden crucifix and a braid of garlic. By his hands he held in his left a mirror and a wooden stake on his right. Iris grinned her teeth at Kane as she laughed that this man thinks that these mundane items, crucifix aside, can even remotely harm her. I don't think you can harm me with those nightman. Iris mockingly teased. That's exactly what a vampire begging for her life would say. Are you just going to just keep calling me that? Nightman? Kane frowned. Private, Iris, please settle down. Hannah mediated. The two stilled their emotions and calmly rested themselves. Kane, however was still under tension as he stared daggers at Iris, ready to pounce at her in case she tries to make a move. Now we are gathered here today because Iris has been shown to be cooperating with our interrogations after she had been DET, I mean after she checked into our medical bay. And Iris would like to ask a few you question for you private first class Mudwin. Iris said. What kind of questions? Why do you want to know? Kane asked. While I bit you, Enightman, during the first time we met, I did a bit of a let's say a ritual that allows me to collect your memories while I drank you blood. Kane stood up with his eyes widened in shock. Then his face painted with anger as he cruelly pointed his finger at Iris. You looked into my memories? What did you see? You cannot know what I know. Kane yelled. Please, these symbols, numbers, and images in my head? I must know. Iris pleaded. Like I will every tell you. This conversation is over. Kane angrily stood up and proceeded to storm out of the room. No. Kane we just barely begun. Hannah begged but the Nigerian ignored her. Iris simply couldn't lose this opportunity to find the answers that plagued her mind. She was at the verge of breaking down in a panicked cry as she tried to find a way to keep Kane from leaving her in the void of ignorance. May I at least ask you about, Marth? Iris said. Kane paused as he was about to turn the knob of the door as his ears heard the word of, Marth coming from the vampire. And what do you know about it? Kane softly spoke in a stark contrast to his tone a few moments ago. You were served this brown soup called, Marth, during your tenth birthday. May I at least know what exactly it is? Iris asked. Her words seemed to be able to pierce through the Nigerian's tough exterior as the man loosened his posture and began to breathe slowly. It is my favorite dish back when I still lived in the US. My mom used to cook that for me. Kane said. Your favorite? It actually tastes quite good. Iris said, now calm to see that the Nigerian is now more sociable. All right, I will entertain some questions for a while vampire. Kane walked back inside the room and then sat down next to Iris' left side. Now with the answer right in front of her, Iris readied herself for the questions she will ask and the revelations will she obtain. 
So, what do you want to ask me vampire? Kane asked. My name is Iris, not vampire. Iris objected. Says the woman who calls me Nightman. And I am the only racist in this room. Kane rebutted. Fine, Kane Mudwin what are these symbols and numbers in my head? Iris asked. Well you got to be more specific on what kind of stuff you're seeing in your brain of yours. Kane sternly scolded. I can draw it. Iris said. Oh, here you go. Dr. Hannah said. She turned the papers on her clipboard over and passed it with a pen to Iris. After receiving the writing implements and drawing medium, Iris drew the letters PB, then drew the numbers of 82, on top of the letters. She turned the clipboard over to Kane for him to examine. That is the periodic table you must be seeing, and this is one of the elements. Lead. Yes, that's what CU-29 is. Kane said. Yours magics have elements too. That is a strange way to say fire, ice, dark, light, life or something. How can lead be an element? I mean I only recall lead ever being used to make official seals, paint and statues. Iris commented. Oh, you won't believe what kind of things we can do with lead. Power, ammunition, cables can't live without. Maybe I can show you one such thing later. Next question. Kane eagerly said. Prompted by the answers she obtained and the eagerness from Kane, Iris flipped the paper of the clipboard again and drew another series of symbols and numbers. She drew the letters of DS, then the symbol greater than or equal to, and finally the number zero. Turning it over to Kane to examine, she froze awaiting her answer. The Nigerian stared at the equation for over a minute struggling to identify the symbols Iris wrote. Even Dr. Hannah who was observing the makeshift interview was just as confused as him. For a moment all was silent. Did I give you a hard one? Iris asked breaking the monotony of the room's soundless void. No, but I think I can help. Okay, give me a second let me check my phone. Kane said. He reached into his left pocket by his pants and grabbed a small orange-colored rectangular device from it, and held it firmly in his hands. His hands had seemed to spark the device to life as the screen lit up like the magic mirrors that Iris remembered seeing in her visions. That thing, it looks like something I saw in my visions of you. Only they are bigger and people and words that move were in it. Iris pointed out. Really? Bigger smartphones? Oh, you mean televisions? What did you remember seeing from the TVs? Kane asked. They were talking about a giant flying boat that was recruiting people to colonize a place called Benham 3. The Eardom flew past above me and it was large as a town. Your United Federation of Earth are godlike compared to us. Iris said. Whilst she spoke, Kane placed the pint-sized magic mirror above her drawing. A loud snapping sound occurred before Kane took his magic mirror back close to him and began to fiddle his fingers with the device. Alisa. Can you identify the formula in this drawing I took? Kane asked his magic mirror. Identifying searching database I found your answer. This is the formula for the second law of thermodynamics. A voice replied from within the miniature magic mirror or smartphone. Alisa. What can you tell us about the second law of thermodynamics? Kane asked again to his smartphone. The second law of thermodynamics states that the state of entropy of the entire universe, as an isolated system, will always increase over time. The second law also states that the changes in the entropy in the universe can never be negative. Said Alicia. Entropy universe it's basically saying that energy goes away as time passes. Iris answered. Yes, that's it. Are you getting the answers you seek? Dr. Hannah asked. Yes, and I got so much more to ask from you. Iris smiled like an eager student. Um, I am sorry am I afraid I can't just give you all the answers you want by me alone. You can read and understand our language, right? Kane inquired. Yes, almost perfectly I think. Iris answered. Well I can give you a book later about how our science and technology works so you can read. If Hannah said slowly stopping to catch herself from completing her second sentence. If what? 
Iris asked astonished by the request. She was doing so well getting the answers, but now she has been hit with a wall that halt her progress. You are perhaps the first and presently the only native of Benham, three, that can understand and speak our language. My superiors have deemed you very useful for our colony's development plans as you being familiar with the land and the language. You can be the colony's guide and translator into Beham, 3 or as you have told me, Glyesia. Hannah explained. And what do I get from this proposition? Iris asked. Well the books I promise you is one such compensation. You can even live here in our new town once it's built. We can even do some favors for you in exchange for your help. With consultation from Governor White of course. Hannah negotiated. All right, although I do want to add that I am not interested in the living with you due to personal space reasons, but I can agree with the rest. Iris nodded. Phew. For the first time in five long days we have some good news after that damn bandit attack. Kane smiled. You we were attacked by bandits some time ago? Iris asked. Yes when we landed five days ago some men tried to burn us and kill us. We fought them off well, but then one man in robes summoned some giant fire golem monster and tried to burn us alive. Thankfully Lieutenant Rose alongside me and the squad killed it with fire extinguishers fire extinguishers. Kane laughed. You fought the burning horse bandits and won? Iris exclaimed catching both Dr. Lee Hanuel and Kane by surprise. Why? Who are these burning horse bandits? Kane asked. They are the most dangerous family of brigands this side of the Principality and Valley. They have been known to raid villages and extort money off of the people from all walks of life. Everyone is scared of them as they have over 1,000 members. Iris said. That sounds troubling. What else did they do? Kane asked. I have heard that if someone refuses to pay up, their home gets trampled by their horsemen first as a warning. If they refuse again, they sent their pyromaniacs or sometimes a fire mage to burn your house when you are away. If you still refuse then they kidnap you and your family and burn all of you alive as a warning to others to pay their protection. Dot. Iris said. My god that's horrible. They are definitely bad news. Would it be great with you if we can maybe take them down or something for you? Nobody should live like that. Kane declared proudly. Iris was shocked that those words came out of the Nigerian's mouth. Very few people had the guts to stand up to the burning horse bandits, not even the nobility of the principality of Tyrian where she lives couldn't lay their fingers on them due to bribery and blackmail that their leader Devico would throw at them. Devico practically had free reins on what he could do in Tyrian and nobody could stop him. Yet these people from another world stood up to these oppressive outlaws so confidently, that Iris assume Kane is suffering from a case of suicidal overconfidence. But I have seen them do horrible things to so many people. They once robbed me and stole my most prized possession, a purified mana crystal necklace. I use it to power some of my more potent spells and demanding experiments, but I lost it when the bandits raided my home. Iris sadly muttered. A mana crystal? Hey Dr. Hanuel, you said that the science team is working on studying some necklace we found on a dead, mage, guy who my team killed after we took down that fire golem right? Kane asked Hannah. Yes, do you think it's hers? Hannah wondered. Do you have it now? Let me see it. It is not only a valuable possession of mine but a family heirloom of the Kadohagans. Iris said. Well it does look pretty to hang in a jewelry store when I saw it. Maybe it is your necklace. Hannah can you get it from Dr. Mahalona? Kane asked. Sure, wait here. Kane keep an eye on our guest while I fetch the necklace. Hannah stood up and exited the room leaving Kane and Iris alone together. It was all quiet staring with both of the two physically contrasting figures. Iris was excitedly by the edge of her seat hoping to be reunited with her necklace, while Kane however was alerted off the edge of his chair when he was told that the necklace will be given back to its previous, magically attuned owner. What if Iris uses the power of that necklace to escape? Then a knock on the door before it was opened and came in Dr. Lee Hanuel and another man. He was tall and authoritative in appearance and wore the green garments that UFE soldiers were wearing. 
Iris Kadohagan, I am Colonel Polonsky, commander of the Benham, 3, Colonial Militia. The newcomer in the room sternly said. And what brings you to me, Colonel? Iris asked. The colonel silently grabbed an object from the breast of his jacket, it was the necklace they have retrieved from the mage who was controlling the fire golem. That's my necklace. Iris excitedly exclaimed. Her irises opened in joy as she tried to reach for her necklace, but the restraints locked her in place. So, Samantha's wild guess was correct. You are indeed the owner of this necklace. I got to say madam, it's indeed beautiful. Polonsky complimented. Yes, it is as I said before a family heirloom now can I have it back? Iris asked. No at least not yet. Polonsky slyly said as he slides back Iris' necklace to his jacket. What? How dare you? Give it back! Iris snapped. Her body struggled for freedom beneath the restraints, but she was tied down by reinforced fibers designed to tie down a rampaging elephant. I will return it in time Iris so please calm down. Polonsky said. How soon? Iris growled her teeth showing and her eyes hungered for blood causing everyone in the room to shudder fearfully. Work for us and in time this necklace will be back into your hands. You can either play nice or be put down where you lay. I am giving you a chance right now Ms. Kadohagan. Now choose what happens next. Polonsky shrewdly responded. Iris gulped, being under the servitude of someone is undesirable for a woman of her kind and status, but she will get her necklace back, but what if they don't keep their word? Her next choice was to break free from her leather straps, grab her necklace and fight her way out of the place, she knows that she isn't too far away from her home, but what kind of opposition will she face outside of that door? There could be more soldiers waiting for her to try and make a move that would gladly shoot her down. So far Dr. Lee Hanuel and Kane Mudwin were so far being nice to her right now and it was playing to her advantage until then. Iris reasoned herself for a moment until she come up with her choice. With a swallowed pride she says, all right, I will help you. The vampire witch said. You made the right choice Ms. Kadohagan. Dr. Lee Hanuel, I assign you to be her liaison. I want you to study what she knows and relay it back to command. Polonsky ordered. Yes Colonel. Hannah nodded. The next day. Hey hold still I need to get this screw back and done. Kane ecstatically said. He backed off a laying down Vincent as he finished reinstalling Vincent's battle augmentations. The ex-thief had used several augmentations during his old criminal career such as a rapid movement booster. The R.M.B. August allows an individual to dash and quickly move almost instantaneously in whatever direction he chose. Its initial purpose was to allow soldiers who are often in the role of the point man to reflexively react quickly in close quarters and emergency situations for superior combat performance compared to their naturalized adversaries. However, the R.M.B. August has found its way into the hands of criminal elements which is used by them to get away from law enforcements, or get an edge in combat in a pitch. Although, Vincent was given an older and inferior model of the August he was used to having before it was confiscated during his arrest. Okay, Kane. All right ready with the watch. Vincent asked Samantha. Let's see what you got. Ready? Set? Go! Samantha shouted as she pressed the button on her smartphone stopwatch to go. Vincent activated his rapid movement booster and launched himself forward breezing past his squad mates, as he approached the large empty cargo crates that Samantha has set up for training. He with the August's aid quickly mounted the steel mountain and climbed to the top. There the next obstacle was a 10 meter gap to the other side of another mountain of stacked cargo crates. The record for the longest, natural, jump distance was around 8 meters, but thanks to the R.M.B. August it can easily go beyond that distance. Vincent tossed himself forward as his August pushed his legs like no ordinary man can even dream of achieving towards the landing in front of him. He sticks it. Whoa! That's what I am talking about. Crocker cheered as he clapped his hands loudly. He was joined by Obedia and Kane who also clapped. Samantha however was still doubting Diaz's abilities as she stared at her stopwatch. There is no way he can beat it in 30 seconds, she said to herself. After climbing down the crates, 
the next obstacles were a dozen logs that were constructed like hurdles that he must successively clear. Dashing forward, Vincent cleared them with the grace of a Kentucky Derby champion racehorse. Look at him go! Obedia commented. For the last obstacle in his way from victory was a barbed wire field that he must crawl under while subjected to mud. Diving down and slightly sliding a few feet, Vincent and his augmented body got to work crawling through. This is the hardest part of the course. No way, no way he can make it. Samantha said. Vincent's limbs plowed through the mud like a real plow as he effortlessly pushed himself through the mud. After he was out of the barbed wire, he stood up and began to run for the last meters of distance to back where he started. Come on home stretch you can make it. Kane cheered. Using the dash ability from his r.m.b orgs, Vincent covered the ground with his feet, but to the naked eye, it was almost as if he was blinking rapidly towards the finish line. With a final mighty roar from him, Vincent dived forward to as his body flew past the finish line and his squad mate's body slamming onto the Glesian floor. So how did I do? Vincent exhaled as he breathed heavily and sweated profusely from his exertions. Just a few milliseconds to spare. I got to say Private Diaz. I am impressed. Samantha smiled although it was forced from her as she still sees the ex-thief with contempt. Ha! 29 point something seconds. If only I had my old orgs back I can give you half that time. Vincent boasted. You know that can't be right. Kane said. I know, but I could dream, Vincent said as he picked himself back up and brushed off the dirt from his shirt. Attention! Yelled a voice that broke the light-hearted moment. Strider group scrambled to form a line, stand proudly and saluted to Colonel Polonsky walked towards them. Alongside him was Iris and Dr. Lee Hanyol. Your discipline is starting to show now. That is good for your next mission. Polonsky complimented the squad. Thank you sir. Samantha saluted. At ease Lieutenant. Polonsky said. The squad rested their postures and awaited their new orders. I have a relatively easy job for you that will not involve fighting anyone. As of the moment we have been gathering intel from our new informant Ms. Kadohagan for intel about this land, and she has told me that she has several books from her home that she would like to show to our science team. I have assigned your squad to escort Ms. Kadohagan back to her home and retrieve these books. Polonsky briefed. Yes sir, Samantha hesitantly said. She couldn't believe that she now has to treat the person who almost killed her and her squad was now to be treated a VIP. Is that some reluctance coming from you Lieutenant Rose? Polonsky grumbled at Samantha. No sir. Samantha picked her discipline up and saluted back to the colonel. Good, I want Ms. Kadohagan and those books of hers to be back here within the next hour. Dismiss. On the road to Iris' home. The road was quiet that day as Strider Group returned to old dilapidated house with Iris in tow, and the theme inside their cruiser was tense to say the least. Iris sat between Vincent and Kane in the back, Samantha driving, Obedia on shotgun and Crocker manning the milligram turret. All of the squad members honestly didn't want to go back to that wretched place, and having the owner who almost killed them inside their cruiser got everyone on edge. Why do you all feel scared? Am I not your friend now? Iris asked. Well for starters you tried to kill us more than a day ago. And we are not your friends. Samantha talked. It is rude for a lady to talk without facing the person they are talking to. Iris pouted. Well hello there vampire girl. I am driving right now I can't just face you. Samantha talked back. How rude. Iris snapped. The vampire leaned forward towards Samantha but Kane stopped her. Not a good idea right now miss. Sit back. Kane sternly said. The vampire grudgingly agreed as she leaned back to her seat. I am just bored right now. All of I have been doing was just talking with Dr. Mahalona and Hannah for hours and I could really use something to relax with. Iris sighed. If you want a bite, it's a no from me. Vincent said as he covered his neck from Iris. I am bored, not hungry you naughty little rascal. Iris come back. Oh, the vampire is sassy. Vincent teased. 
Hey, I am actually quite bored too just like her. I think I can help with that for everyone. I got some nice beats from my phone that I listen to when I go on road trips. Maybe you can listen to my favorite southern gothic song if you want. This one is a goldie. Obedia suggested. Oh, sure if it's coming from you. Play it. Crocker said from the turret. What is southern gothic? Iris asked. It's best you listen to it. I hope you will like it. Obedia smiled. He placed his phone on a portable speaker he keeps and twiddled his fingers to select the song from his playlist. At first there was silence, then a beating drum and the sounds of strings coming from a guitar played. Play priest and William Crichton. The lyrics from the Obed speaker ringed like hush lulls to Iris. She has never heard of the kind of music before and not even the famous elven bards can even hope to match the rhythm that she has heard. She was in bliss as she indulged herself in the audio that besieged her ears smiling happily and eyes closed. I think she likes it. Obedia said. Quiet let me hear this, Iris said. Yeah definitely like it hey is that smoke? Kane pointed. Samantha looked forward from her driver's seat and noticed that was the direction they are taking to go to Iris' house. That's where we're heading right. Floor it lieutenant. Crocker shouted as he cocked the machine gun readying himself for a fight. Samantha stepped on the gas of their cruiser causing the engine to roar as it sped past the Verdon Valley Forest's trees. Iris hanged on tight from her seatbelt as she braced herself on the tremendous, or at least by her kind standard speed of the steel horse that the UFE can commandeer. As the cruiser parked wildly at the entrance of Iris' home the place was a smoldering mess of ash and fire. The squad and Iris got out of the vehicle in utter dismay as they saw the house was now nothing but blackened wood and scorched stone. From those ruins the banner of a horse standing upright, with an inflamed illustration in the background was posted in front of what was Iris' front door. Iris knelt down and gathered the ashes of her raised home and cried, wailing loudly to the sky. I curse you all burning horse bandits. And may your disgusting leader Devico die a thousand deaths. Iris screamed. Iris, we are so sorry. Kane comforted her. He placed his hand on Iris soldier and rubbed it which was a small remedy to her emotional state. I know, it's not your fault it's the fucking burning horse's fault. She growled. As the vampire mourned the loss of the very home she has built with her own two magical hands, Samantha, in the back, solemnly contacted her superiors by the radio. HQ, this is Strider lead, Iris' home was destroyed by hostile elements. She said. Flashback, about a week after the conclave explosion. My gods they are back. They are more. They kill kill kill. Owen screamed, he kicked and flailed his arms like a crying babe as several of his Magi peers kept him still and from hurting himself or other people. What did he see in the visions? Said one of the Magi. I do not know. Apprentice. Where are that elixir? Said another. Right here master. Said the Magi's apprentice. She passed bottle to her master hurriedly whilst he was struggling to keep him in place. The elixir that was given is a special brew used to sedate restless people and help them feel calm. It was made from special herbs that were imported from the elven continent of Alfulnora which the ingredients can only be found from. Despite the Slegion Empire's envy of the access of unique resources that grows from that paradise-like land, they have got to say, those arrogant elves do know how to make some great brews. Popping the tap open, the Magi placed the elixir onto Owen's lips and force-fed him the drink. As the Grandmaster swallowed the concoction his flailing waned until he was resting comfortable at his bed. Our Queen Elisvan soil it feels sour and loving, Owen dreamily muttered. Grandmaster can you speak to us, the Magi said calmly. What do you want from me? Owen said. The visions? What did you see? What are these demons you spoke of? The Magi asked. Owen was silent as the question wandered through his ears. Oh, how will he explain the horrors he has seen from to his peers? He saw doom and destruction for all and he could get executed for such defamation and libel. Listen carefully and do not tell anyone what I will say. Demons hunger from the stars and see our world as a meal for which to satisfy their desires. 
in their eyes they will see us a bountiful cornucopia for which to devour greedily too. Owen spoke. That can't be true. You surely jest Grandmaster. The Magi exclaimed. He frantically tried to keep his calm but he knew that Jeltica's comets prophesize a great change and the change was apocalyptic that the Empire, and all of Glyasia will not want to experience. Gods forgive me but I saw it with my own eyes. May they have mercy on us all. Owen said. Are we truly doomed to die, another Magi asked. They will send their eyes, to scour the land for souls to eat and when they see us they will gladly come and eat us they will come and scour, they will see all wait if they see souls hum. Owen caught himself as he remembered the visions. He saw eyes fall down from the heavens to scour the land for souls. From the legends and myths of Glyasia, demons need souls as nourishment just as a person needs food to survive. And since no hungry entity would go to a place where there is no food to consume. I think I know how to stop the apocalypse. Owen happily jumped out of his bed, a spark of genius lighted his mind as he began to enact his heroic plan to save his empire and all of Glyasia. But foolishly, his plan will undoubtedly doom everyone to the UFE.